happy to take questions. If I had excess money, I'd be buying land in Canada right now. Um, ultimately, I think the Canadians, much like the rest of the Western Hemisphere, are going to be progressively integrated into a rebranded, larger, larger definition of these United States. Um, and they're going to do so primarily out of self-defense. I mean, with NAFTA, with the relationship we've had with the Canadians for so long, we basically already have almost complete economic integration. The political security integration is vast. Um, it's just a matter about moving towards kind of the deeper embrace that over time becomes conceivable because uh, Canada itself will be overrun with Latinos moving northward. That's the long-term picture. Uh, but uh, bottom line, Canada's future is very bright. They have a lot of power and chips in the game. They just don't have the demographics that allow them to play that hand fully. And much like the Russians, they in effect need help to govern their territory because it is so vast. Historically, the Russians had to co-opt locals. The Canadians don't really have locals. They are going to need to create significant defense structures in the north. They're toying with the idea now. They're exploring it. But over time, it's going to have to be an investment uh, requirement that's going to be met by a much larger pool than what the Canadians themselves can muster. So I see Canada in the same boat as Latin America, joining a larger American Union over time. Um, yeah, I think we could invite Alberta down for a beer now. We could probably have them. Um, Quebec, we could probably sell to, you know, the Europeans. Nova Scotia was the 14th colony. Forgotten. But to me, it's, uh, it's not something that comes about through hegemony. It comes about by rethinking the notion of membership and throwing open the notion of membership when countries joined the EU over the last 15 to 20 years, nobody called that imperialism. They called that a golden ticket. And eventually, that same process is going to unfold in the Western Hemisphere, with the big driver being getting rid of the drug war. And once we test the waters, and I think Cuba's a really prime target, um, and we start having, you know, almost like the equivalent of the Missouri Compromise, we've got to let in a slave state and a free state, except now it's a Republican and a Democrat. I think we'll start to see paired entries into the system. Sort of like DC gets in with Puerto Rico, Cuba gets in with, you know, whoever. And that'll be the process over time. And I don't, you know, go back to what Russia controlled in 1989. Look what Russia controls now. We got all the Warsaw Pact. We got the Baltics, to my complete amazement. We got Finland and Sweden to basically de facto sign up to NATO. And what he's done is bite back little pieces of Georgia and the Ukraine, which are old Russian imperial constructs. He's got a $2 trillion economy. NATO's got a $34 trillion economy. So am I worried with his demographics? No. What he's accomplished in the Ukraine is the right to sell China large amounts of resources at much lower prices. Not exactly a windfall for him. And now with the slowdown in the Chinese economy, we're seeing even some of these uh, touted uh, investments in the Arctic North and the planned uh, huge natural gas deal, which was in negotiation for 10 years and then got cut almost immediately the day after uh, the sanctions started in response to the Ukraine. Even that's probably not going to raise Russia significantly well. So they basically become an economic vassal of the Chinese, who are, if you've ever done business in China, brutal. Some of the most brutal capitalists on the planet. So good luck, Russia. Enjoy that for what it's worth. Um, do I find it amazing that he's going to use his military industrial complex to export and try to make himself relevant wherever he can? I don't find it surprising. Is he taking advantage of the fact that we've written off the whole Mesopotamia thing? Absolutely. Is it decisive? I don't think so. I don't think that picture that I gave you gets altered one bit. But, you know, we could talk about Russia coming back, China going to take us on. Man, this is the most dangerous point in human history. 
except it's not. Sir, I, I don't think they're easy to topple for all the reasons you saw in the interview. Which, <laughs> which actually is a pretty good movie. I mean, it's pretty amazing. I mean, he is a godlike creature and that system is basically military run and they're not going to get rid of their god no matter what. Uh, the only people who can really topple that system are the Chinese and they're basically busting the place out for about six trillion dollars worth of minerals which the Korean military is selling off at bargain basement prices and when the Chinese get all the minerals out of there they're going to be like torch the place <laughs> for the insurance. <laughs> otherwise known as the South Koreans. You know, so what chips do they have? They have nothing other than the ability to command a certain amount of attention now and then. They're not really important unless we allow them to be. Now I gotta tell you, this is kind of funny because, you know, the interview was on and I was over giving a talk in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and I got to have a couple of meals with Mata Yir, and I just had to ask him, did you ever see the movie Zoolander? because we were talking about the interview. <laughs> you got to see that movie. <laughs> <sighs> Funny stuff. I believed in the Big Bang strategy. I remember going to the JFK library in Boston with my son and saw JFK as a senator in 1956 describe the Middle East situation and nothing had changed from 1956. I mean, you could have put him on hardball with Chris Matthews and it would have been totally apt in the year 2001. Nothing had changed. So the Bush-Cheney hubris or ambition or daring was basically to say, I'm going to lay a big bang on the Middle East. If I do it right, everything changes. Guess what? If I do it wrong, everything still changes. So I guess it's, it's a no-lose situation. It is a loss for us in terms of our perspective and interaction with the world because what they basically did, the huge flaw, besides using that Leviathan force and then abandoning the responsibility for the small wars follow-on force, was what they did was they told the world, basically, if you're not man enough to show up for the war, do not show up for the post-war. And we tried to husband and control and monopolize the post-war reconstruction and integration of Iraq. Did the same thing in Afghanistan. That was so unbelievably stupid. In the end, Afghanistan is going to be integrated by Pakistan, India, Russia, Iran, to a certain extent Turkey, and obviously China. And the Middle East, oh, I showed you where the oil went. So obviously, we should have given the post-war reconstruction to the Chinese right from the start. But that would have been a level of economic realism to go with their political realism, which was astute, I would argue. But because they only thought of war within the context of war, and the rest was like, shit happens. I mean, almost his word quote, Rumsfeld. You know, that was unforgivable. The time they took to finally embrace coin and counterinsurgency probably cost us 3,000 lives that did not need to be lost. That was unforgivable. Creating the overwhelming desire of the American public to run away from this revived capacity for small wars, that was also unforgivable because it gets us Syria now, which is a huge and vast human tragedy. Really bad. But we're done with it for now. Although, it's interesting, my priest on mass last Saturday, you know, he's like, you know, it's starting to remind me of the way priests and ministers talked uh, in the 1990s. You know, how can we allow this to happen? Well, if you really want to pull the string on that sweater, it's called send a force in and make something happen. Sit on it. Sit on it like we sat on the Berlin Wall. Sit on it like we sat on the DMZ since 1953. Go sit. Wait for the crazies to die off or hunt them down individually and kill them. We're doing that part. But unless you want to babysit for a long time, you're not going to settle it. So you leave it to the locals to settle it, and the locals are more interested in screwing each other. Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia. So it's going to be a bloody place for quite some time. It's a real tragedy that just some simple mistakes in the way they looked at it, their arrogance about the post-war, uh, you know, as I said at the time, in my TED talk, do not start a war unless you're willing to start the peace and really maintain it. 
That's the, that's the hard part of it. It's easy to take down countries. We can do that anywhere in the world. And everybody knows it. But now we're self-restrained by the knowledge that we can't deal with the post-war. We don't have the stomach or the strategic patience for it. And it's too bad, because we basically won that post-war when Bush finally got the message in the 2006 midterm and finally embraced the coin, which of course was his idea all along. Except they fought it tooth and nail. And I know it because I was there. And they fought it tooth and nail. Wanted nothing to do with it. That was unforgivable. Sir, you know, I don't buy the, the crooked line link between climate change and vast national security problems. I see it as a political, social, economic adjustment. And I described what I think is the great vector. It's from the middle to the north and to the south. I don't see that as a national security thing. And when the Pentagon reaches for that, I just, I, I'm uncomfortable. I think the millennials have embraced this notion very seriously. I think they're the political generations that's going to push it through. I think uh, Obama was basically an avatar of theirs. You know, and the way he raised money was very fitting. That's how he got in. He raised money very differently. Social networks and everything else. Uh, but he was elected largely to unravel the the negative Bush legacy that I just described. Um, the real one, and they talk about this person on the net all the time, it's right out of the matrix, the one they're looking for. You know, Bernie Sanders is a bit of an avatar. Hillary probably isn't it. Um, I would argue Jeb Bush is not bad because of his Latino connection. And uh, I believe he's also Catholic, which would kind of ease some of that package. So his wife and his family are a big influence. The rest of the field, I look at them and, you know, they're just sad retreads of bad ideas. None of them deserve anything. Um, so it's slim pickings, I got to say right now. We're probably still an election or two from seeing the real millennial progenitor. And maybe we have to wait till a millennial runs, for all I know. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if somebody came from the non-political world, because you know, you're watching Carson and Trump do well now. They're looking for authenticity. Um, they're not looking for hierarchical control. The millennials, you know, they're self-learners. They teach each other. They're peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, all that's going to happen inevitably. And their embrace of small, distributed, clean technologies is going to proceed, not on any national security basis. It's going to be done because it's cool, because it's efficient, because it's the way to go, it's the future, it's the way we should treat the planet, all that kind of stuff. So I, I really don't worry about it. I only point out the fact that we bought ourselves this wonderful breathing period during the great rise of India and China. You know, just magnificent that America accomplished this just when we needed it. And we're progressively taking that next step down the hydrocarbon chain from oil to natural gas. That alone is fabulous. That allows us to start rethinking the carpool. You know, you start getting uh, long haul carriers, cab fleets, um, buses on compressed natural gas, natural gas filling stations. Then you start moving towards much more ultralight vehicles. And then your capacity, I think, is really turbocharged when you get the driving of the car by uh, artificial intelligence which I don't think happens on a fell swoop basis, but more likely it's going to be interstates are going to be s totally censored and wired. And when you pull onto the interstate, you're going to sort of like release control. Almost like you got in the car at Disney World and you're not, you're not in control anymore. And you're going to say, get me off on exit whatever. And then you're going to do, you know, check your social media and do your work. And then when you get off, then you're going to resume control and drive locally. That's how I think it works out. And when that happens, then we get rid of car crashes at high speed you know, then the ultralight and the shift towards hydrogen, that all becomes much more feasible. So I think AI plays a very good and positive role. I know robots are going to rule the world and kill everybody, but I think it's going to work out. Thank you very much.